Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk about the uh, numerical approaches to bouncing cosmologies. Um, and here's a, a rough outline of my talk. So I'll first try to motivate like why we might want to use numerical methods. And essentially it's uh, because we're tackling regions in gravity, whether it's Einstein gravity or beyond Einstein gravity, which is well within the nonlinear regime of the theory. And so numerics is a good uh, tool to, to uh, approach such, such problems. Um, I'll then spend a little bit of time look, uh, looking at two earlier studies that have been done in this sort of fully nonlinear regime for bouncing cosmologies. Um, I just want to apologize. I know there's, there's been a lot of studies that have been done in, in general in nonlinear cosmology. I don't want to sort of exclude all the many people in this audience that have worked on that. But just for you know, lack of time, I'm going to focus on the bouncing cosmologies, non-singular bouncing cosmologies, as that's sort of the focus of our program. Um, and then essentially sort of carrying on from where Anna left off yesterday. So Paul and Anna sort of introduced and motivated the program. Uh, Anna sort of highlighted some of the, the first steps that we're taking towards realizing this goal of understanding these bouncing cosmologies in the nonlinear regime. I will spend a little bit of time thinking ahead, sort of what, what are the problems that we might be facing? Um, and in other words, what are the problems and therefore what are the opportunities? What are the things that we can hope to, to learn um, by numeric, uh, numeric, applying numerical methods to these cosmologies? Okay, so why, why do we think we might need numerical methods, essentially the tools that can deal with nonlinearities? Well, one is uh, we're in, an, in a regime of Einstein gravity, so even going, not, not even thinking beyond Einstein gravity, where we really are in a nonlinear regime of the theory. Um, and that, you know, the, perhaps you know, that's not necessarily, that doesn't necessarily obviously come to mind. Um, and the reason is, is you know, even today, the, the evolution of the universe on large scales, so on scales of the Hubble radius, is well within the nonlinear regime of general relativity. But the reason that we can sort of get away with not having to deal with nonlinear tools is, fortunately, we have an exact solution or an exact class of solutions, the Friedman, Robertson, Rourke, Grilla matrix uh, solutions, that, if you will, they capture the essential nonlinearity of the problem. And for most of what's relevant to observational cosmology, then, we really only have to deal with perturbations about the solution. So that's kind of, a, kind of an, a fortunate situation that even though you know, on scales of the Hubble radius, we really are in the nonlinear regime of relativity, you know, the, the evolution of the universe is very much like uh, the problem inside of black holes. So it's, ve it's very nonlinear, but fortunately we have an exact solution. Um, now, we want to sort of focus on the early universe. We want to go into to places where you know, we might have to go beyond uh, general relativity, but even in general relativity, um, sort of this this property, this, 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 this feature that we have for, for the late time universe is not necessarily going to hold. And we definitely know it's not going to hold for sort of classically singular bounces. Um, I mean, there in some sense, it's, things are so bad, it's not just that we have to deal with nonlinearities that are away from Friedman, Robinson, Walker. We have to probably go to a different theory. Um, there, the, the evolution takes us to a regime where we need quantum gravity. Um, with non-singular bounce models, I'd say at the moment, for the most part, even though there are many proposed models, um, Anna gave one uh, yesterday, there are many proposed models, but I think for in the large part, it's unclear how viable these are. And one of the questions is, how robust are they to, to small perturbations, especially because you, you might imagine that a non, the region about a bounce is a very violent, you know, non-singular event. And so perturbations, you know, even forgetting about all the quantum issues, you know, uh, things about the theory, just from a, the, the, the point of view of classical evolution, gravity in such a, in such a, a high curvature regime, uh, you know, do we have to worry about uh, nonlinearities? And so that, that's sort of a reason why we, um, we think that we might need to bring numerics to bear to study some of these non-singular bouncing models. So the motivation for non-singular bouncing, I'm not, I don't have to <laughs> go over that again because you know, the, Paul did, did that yesterday and Anna as well, and she sort of uh, introduced um, some of the first steps towards how we might approach non-singular bouncing cosmologies. Um, so what I'm you know, instead going to do is you know, m motivate sort of the next steps and also show a little bit uh, on, some, on what has been done before. Um, and, you know, like a, the, perhaps the, the main take home message that you might have gotten from yesterday from Anna's talk is it's really crucial if you want to solve classical PDEs, we need a well posed initial value problem. Um, and there is at least one very nice example where we can study non singular bounces, which do, does have a classically well posed problem, and that's Einstein gravity coupled to a ghost field. So just take a, a usual scalar field. 
Um, it's got the dynamics of a scalar field, but the way you couple it to gravity is you flip the sign of the, the kinetic term. So it's got negative energy as it couples to gravity. And with that, you can engineer bounces. The, the equations are, you know, are, are well behaved and we can, and, and we can solve them. Uh, the problem is that such models are not quantum mechanically viable um, because of the negative energy states. And so the, the reason why people have tried to go beyond such models, and for example, the one class that Anna introduced yesterday was this class of Ondesky models, is we want to try to come up with something that perhaps has a hope of eventually being you know, viable, or perhaps as an effective th a theory of uh, description. Um, so in other words, you know, the, 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 the crucial thing that one needs to engineer to get um, a contracting universe, you know, in an Einstein gravity-like scenario from going from a contraction to an expansion, is this a null convergence condition has to be uh, violated. Um, and so you can, you can do that, one, by having matter that violates a null energy condition. That's what this ghost field does. Or you can perhaps try to modify gravity in some way where perhaps the matter still might have well-behaved quantum properties, but gravity is somewhat different where it doesn't necessarily force convergence to lead to a singularity always. Okay, so where, where does numerics fit in? And I've mentioned this a few times, and it's really about the nonlinearities, but let me first get a little pet peeve of mine out, out of the way. I really don't like being called a numerical relativist. Um, and the reason is, you know, if you think of all other branches of science, what it implies is it's a subfield of relativity research, and it's not. You know, you know I'm a relativist. I, I study gravity and the various consequences of that, and the, you know, the, the, the field of research, it's a field of science. Numerics is a tool, it's a method. And I don't know of any other field where subfields are labeled by a method that people use. <laughs> you know, are, are you a Feynman diagram field theorist? Or a, you know, <laughs> you know it's just, so it's silly. So I, I don't like that phrase. You know, and if, if numerics you know, becomes very you know, important in early universe cosmology, please don't call those people numerical cosmologists. Um, now, I'll, I'll call you perturbative cosmologists then, or perhaps perturbed cosmologists might be better. <laughs> but, okay, but okay, okay, kidding aside, you know, so, that, so the thing is, it's not that we, we're doing numerics because that's a field of study. Numerics are a tool. Um, and in particular, they're a useful tool um, if we think that nonlinearities in the equations are going to be important. It's just, and it's not that you know, if, if we had other tools, we'd use them, but this is just one, uh, one tool, and it's got advantages and disadvantages. So let me sort of just briefly describe some of those. So um, the pros, and you know, the, the first point is really, really why we think this might be a useful tool in these situations is um, if you've got a well-posed problem and you've got the basic algorithms and techniques that can, that, that, that can be used to address it, you know, the complexity of the equations, complexity structure in the initial conditions, and nonlinearities up to a point are really not an issue at all. It doesn't matter how many hundreds or thousands of terms there are in your equations, and you know, with some of these complicated theories, that really is what's right. There literally are thousands of terms uh, in the equations. You have many, many fields. They're all coupled. It's nonlinear. Computers don't care. They just, okay, they, it takes power, uh, perhaps complicated computers, but that's not an issue. Another pro is that uh, numerics are unforgiving to ill-posed problems. Um, in the sense, if you have a theory um, you might be able to find exact solutions. And you know, there are examples in cosmology where you can find nice exact solutions if you assume homogeneity, isotropy, etc. <laughs> but the underlying theory is ill-posed, which means that's really, uh, that, that's really not actually giving you insight into the theory because generically, uh, you, that theory, when you have little perturbations, is not going to be able to be predictive. You're not going to be able to recover that exact solution you found. And the nice thing with numerics is if, you don't have a, if, you, if you're not sure about it, well, numerics is not going to be forgiving. It's not going to allow you to get solutions to ill-posed theories. So it's, it's a very strong filter in some sense. Um, you know, if, we, if we think that our physical theory should have well-posed mathematical equations, numerics completely relies on that. You can't get by that. And just one, one, one thing that I, I like about numerics is the way that you get insight into the problems is it's a very visual field. You look at solutions. Um, yeah, the computers, they produce tons of these numbers, and numbers don't make any sense to me, but we visualize them. And so you actually, the, the way that you study solutions to problems is you just look at them. You can understand all aspects of, the, of solutions by visualization, which I think is a nice feature. Okay, but what, what are the cons? One thing is it's, you know, if, if especially if there's a novel problem where there isn't an existing code which you can easily adapt, uh, it's, it's often a very time-consuming uh, enterprise to develop a code from scratch. Um, 
I mean, as anyone here who's done numerics knows, it's not, it's not easy to go from you know, equations to working code. It, it takes a lot of time. And also, there are no, there are no sort of back-of-the-envelope shortcuts. Um, the, we can simplify problems in situations, like some of the examples I'll show, uh, we, don't, we don't relax all the symmetries in the problem, but even the simplest problem, the first problem that you might be able to understand, that's the full problem. And so with numerics, you can do little back-of-the-envelope calculations sort of to quickly scope out what might or might not be working. You really have to sol fol solve the full problem or not. Um, now, one con with numerics is it's unforgiving to yield those problems. <laughs> And I'd mentioned that as a pro, but that actually, you know, on another theory, that, that actually could be a problem, especially in situations where we're looking at theories which we think of are effective theories. We know that in many cases, if, you, if there's a well-behaved full theory, you truncate it in some way, the effective theory could have problems, but that's an artifact of how you've truncated it. And in, in simple examples of that, you could actually anal analytically understand, you know, pencil and paper, what goes wrong. You might introduce modes that, that grow exponentially, but that's an artifact of your truncation. So analytically, you just, don't, you just exclude those modes. Um, the problem is those theories, if you then want to look, look at sort of the full problems, because numerics are unforgiving to them, you can't, you can't solve those problems, at least not naively, not using basic methods with computers, because they don't, they don't care that you've decided that some, some fraction of the solutions are not relevant. They're going to find all of them. Um, you know, the flip side of the, the nice thing about numerics is that you can actually visualize solutions. The flip side is you look at one solution at a time. You find it solution by solution. So, of course, with analytics, it's nice if you can get an analytic solution, especially you know, in a multiple parameter family of solutions. You can get a lot of insight into that by just looking at the analytic expressions and seeing how the, parameter, how the solution varies as a function of the parameters. With numerics, to do that, you have to run a suite of parameters and try and build up intuition and insight. Power series. Um, so, say again? It could be power series or some just some uh, analytic or sort of function, sines, cosines, or some, some, something that you can write down as a closed form uh, mathematical expression in terms of elementary functions. Okay, okay so that was the sort of the pros and cons of numerics. So now let me give you a couple of examples where we've looked at some numerics in early universe uh, cosmology. Um, and I'm going to just briefly discuss this one, which is the more recent one, and then I'll focus a bit more on the, the older one. And one reason is because of this, this, this recent one, I can, it's, it's easier to describe the results just in words, and I've got some nice animations for the earlier one. Um, but so the, 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 this, this, this one result was, uh, this was also related to a question that also came up yesterday. So we've got one of these uh, bouncing cosmologies, and so this was a bounce where we used one of these ghost fields to engineer it. So of course we can address issues about you know, the quantum, quantum issues, but we can address some issues of, well, how do fluctuations survive through the bounce? And if we go into the nonlinear regime and they back react on the geometry, is there some possible problem? Because right, you can imagine, you know, this, this bounce is perhaps a very violent <laughs> regime in the theory. Nonlinear effects could be very significant. What, what goes on? Um, and the answers turned out to be, you know, perhaps you know, what you might expect. So if you have one of these background solutions, if you've got very small fl fluctuations, very small <coughs> perturbations, they propagate through the bounce exactly like you expect. The spectrum isn't distorted. On the other hand, we could find large fluctuations where the back reaction was so strong it actually caused the space-time to run into a singularity. So it destroyed the bouncing solution. And of course, we have these two regimes. So this intermediate regime where you have moderately strong fluctuations where they don't disrupt the bounce. You can actually propagate them through the bounce, but the spectrum of fluctuations is severely distorted. And then, then it's just, okay, well, what, 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 what parameters are you interested in um, if you want to, or you can then, at least with this simplified theory, you, you can then say, well, if we don't, if we want some, we you know, presume nice initial spectrum of fluctuation, scale invariant spectrum for fluctuation, what are the parameters such that that survives the bound? So you can answer those questions. Okay, the next example, this is, again, a little bit earlier, um, but this was to describe or to understand the robustness of this egg pyrotic smoothing mechanism. So the, like one of the things that Paul spent a lot of time on yesterday was to sort of emphasize how, how important that aspect of uh, cosmology is in the contracting phase. Um, and so you know, even, even though this, you know, this study is a little bit older, I think you know, today I would say it's, it's a solved problem. We know that the egg pyrotic mechanism acts as a strong smoother. It was well known sort of perturbatively 
And one of the pieces of data that, that makes us think that this is, you know, this is not something we have to worry about is also some of this, this nonlinear analysis that we did. So let me, let me explain again um, sort of what, what's going on here. And so this is the, well, the slightly different units, but this is the equation that, that Paul had yesterday written. And now I've actually explicitly added this term that describes anisotropy. Right, so this again, this is the Friedman equation. It tells us how the scale factor of the universe evolves with time in a homogeneous uh, background. We have the various components um, that he had introduced, sort of the matter components, uh, matter, radiation, some, some form of matter with an equation of state. I'm using a slightly different parameterization. He used the epsilon. This is this uh, W parameter. Uh, curvature and anisotropy. And so if you want to understand, well, what is, what is relevant to describing how the scale factor evolves, and now thinking about a contracting universe, so A is getting small, and in a singular bound, so incidentally, so this, this study was we were approaching a singular bound, so we did not add a ghost field to make a bound, so we were just looking, so we are running into a singularity, so A does go to zero. And we're saying, well, what happens as we approach A is equal to zero? You know, using this, the sort of the, the, the structure of the powers of these terms, you can say, well, this term is eventually going to be the most important one, this anisotropy. Um, and the thing, so what you can imagine, you know, this is sort of the Friedman equation, it's homogeneous. Um, this is sort of geometric, uh, geometric anisotropy, so we're not adding matter that's producing anisotropy. This is a part of geometry. Um, and of course, so, and I, so you want to think of this as sort of a perturbation um, about the homogeneous background. But the reason why this could be problematic, so you could see, okay, this is going to dominate, and so if you want a universe which is mostly homogeneous, smooth, and isotropic, that could be a problem. But it's actually much more severe than that, because when an isotropy takes over, and it does, the solutions that you get, you get sort of these Kasner-like solutions, which are very, very far from the, f the homogeneous solutions. And this Friedman equation doesn't even make sense. Um, in particular, so the standard, well, one of the Kasner, you can think of one of the Kasner solutions, you've got overall contraction going to the crunch, but the anisotropy is so severe, two directions are contracting, but one's actually expanding. So it's sort of like the interior of a Schwarzschild black hole. And you know, even worse things can happen depending on the matter. You can have, you know, the, you can have these transitions from one Kasner epoch to another where so it's so relatively suddenly one direction starts to expand while one starts to contract. You can even have sort of chaotic behavior where you go through these episodes of uh, different Kasner dynamics. So if this, if this term takes over, that's a disaster. Um, and so from just looking at this equation, the one way, as sort of Paul described, is how we might try to get past this, is we take a form of matter where this, in this parameterization, W is greater than 1, such that this term dominates. And hopefully this matter will not will sort of suppress that, that, that anisotropy and also evolve towards a smooth universe. And that's sort of this ekpyrotic mechanism. If you take a, a scalar with an ekpyrotic potential and choose the parameters right, you can make this W quite large. Um, at least perturbatively, then that does, that does happen. This dominates uh, the, the behavior of the universe approaching A equals zero, and it suppresses anisotropies. So what we wanted to look at is, well, what if we don't start with a small perturbation away from um, F. Friedman, Robertson, Walker. What if we start with something which, um, where, where this equation actually doesn't necessarily even make sense? We have lots of curvature and isotropy and matter. And so, uh, so the next few slides, sorry, there's a lot of equations and it's kind of dense, but the, the, the reason I just sort of cut and pasted these slides from a talk that I gave you know, 10 years ago, and I, I just wanted to, just to explain or show the variables sort of explicitly to illustrate that they you know, just the differences from these. And if anyone actually had a question, like exactly what am I showing, I can refer back to that, and I don't have to try to remember. Um, so one thing that I am going to show is, again, as Paul showed yesterday, a common way of describing this equation is to divide by h squared. And then we have a sum of density components that all sum to 1. So I'll show you exactly what the analog of this is in the regime where we're away from um, this homogeneous background. And so let me just briefly go over this. So we, we solve the Einstein equations with you know, the scalar field with this ekpyrotic type potential in the so-called orthonormal frame formalism, which is a bit unusual. So this is different from the harmonic that uh, Anna spoke about yesterday. We, we sort of use this uh, tetrad-like decomposition to describe the metric. Um, so sorry, again, a whole, a whole mess of stuff. But um, so sort of the, the, the things that I'm, there are certain things here which are somewhat familiar. So 
we, we take the tetrads, we compute their, their commutation relations, and essentially what, what goes into here is sort of the congruence of the, the vector fields that are associated with these things. And for instance, one, the overall, the, uh, the Hubble, the overall expansion rate here is H, that's Hubble, the, the equivalent of the Hubble parameter. This is sort of the shear of that congruence. There are a few other parameters that can be associated with deformations in the spatial metric. So that, that's sort of where all the variables come from. We evolve these with the Einstein equations, but we evolve the so-called Hubbleized, normal, Hubble normalized variables, where we take all of these sort of fundamental definitions and just divide by H. And that turns out to be very convenient to discuss approach to the singularity in the sense that with this and the so-called this constant mean curvature slicing that we use, the singularity, so if we start at t equals zero and let's say t runs forward towards the singularity, the singularity happens at infinity. So we can sort of classically, sort of very carefully study the approach to the singularity without actually running into it. So in terms of these variables, sort of the, the matter energy, so the, 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 the energy in the, the scalar field, you know, there's a potential piece, a time derivative piece, and a gradient piece, and we just normalize them and in, in multiply them by various things, and that's what these Ws's and Vs are. And so the one thing that I will show you is that, you know, that effective equation of state parameter, the pressure to the energy density, and that's just what it is in these variables. But remember, you know, a scalar field isn't an ideal fluid. It doesn't have an equation of state. You know, this is an effective equation of state. And this doesn't even make sense in certain regimes for the scalar field. That's only you know, when you approach homogeneous solutions where you can say that there's really an effective equation of state. And I'll, I'll, use, I'll illustrate that uh, in one example. And so now, okay, let me just go back here. So now in, in uh, going back to like this thing, we're going to have one scalar field. So we have no radiational matter. So we have our scalar field and we have curvature. And we're going to split up the curvature again into sort of a curvature piece and what we're calling a shear piece, which, and both of them are going to represent an isotropy. But that's sort of the equivalent there. And, and so in this case, this is the equivalent equation that we can look at. And, you know, in the full Einstein equations, you know, there is, that, there is an equivalent of the Friedman equation. This really is an identity. But what these particular terms are is just particularly given by this. So this is, you know, the sum of the kinetic, the gradient, uh, the potential pieces for the matter. This is sort of the shear contribution to, you know, curvature and anisotropy. And this is everything else, <laughs> so which, we, which you can all sort of think of as the, 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 the curvature piece. But both omega s and omega k denote... Uh, geometric uh, components to the energy. And so here's, here's one example. So we did several of these, but I'm, I'm just going to show one. And so this is our initial conditions. So again, as a, so this is a three plus one dimensional space time, um, but we're keeping symmetries in two of the space time dimensions. So only one of the spa spatial dimensions we are that we breaking in homogeneity, and that's for computational um, reasons. It's, it's very challenging to do the full three plus one dimensional, so we're just doing it in one dimension, and that's what this one dimension is. So, uh, so I'm going to show this thing evolving in time. This is a spatial dimension, and in that one spatial dimension, we're periodically identifying. So this point is equal to that point. And so this, this is our initial condition. So you can see, we, so we're starting with something which in this one direction is definitely not homogeneous. You can see these are the, the three contributions, the three omega, so they all sum up to one. Um, the matter is yellow, and sort of the two curvature contribute, or the two geometric contributions are the other colors. And you can say in different parts, they, they, they all are non, they're non zero and significant. They, they, they're going to be relevant in this, in this evolution. So now we can see what's going to happen. So we evolve this. Whoops. And so as, as time goes along, you can see. So two interesting regimes develop. So this, this, this part of the universe, um, you can see it's being dominated by the matter. It looks completely homogeneous, and the curvature pieces have become irrelevant. So here, the smoothing mechanism has taken over very nicely. It's smoothed this part of the universe, and we're, you know, thing, things are great. But this doesn't look quite as good. So this is not homogeneous, obviously. Uh, there's a lot of curvature going here. There's, there is still some scalar field, but this is not homogeneous. And in fact, it's, it's even worse. So the next animation, I'm going to just zoom in on this piece and, and go onwards. Um, and so you can see that we have this very complicated dynamics. Um, we are getting several of these sort of mixed master bounces that are going on. 
And in fact, it, this animation is it's, it's actually worse than it is. So you, you see these sort of spike-like structures form, and this is what, what happens generically. They're actually not going away, um, but we used adaptive mesh refinement in the simulation, so we're zooming on, on them. They're becoming very, very narrow, but in this visualization, I've just converted it to a uniform grid, so they've sort of slipped below the, the scale of this animation. But we get these spiky features. You can see it's very hom you know, homogeneous. Each point here is some Kasner-like universe with this very anisotropic expansion. So uh, you, know, you can obviously see in this sense it's not homogeneous in the x direction, but each one of these local universes are very, very different from FR or from Freedom Robertson Walker. So in this part of the universe, it's a disaster. And so you can say, okay, you know, the, you know, the, the, the smoothing mechanism worked reasonably well, but not, not, not over the whole universe, but actually it turns out to be better than that. <laughs> and the, what, to, to understand that, this, this I'm just plotting as a function of the coordinates of the simulation. Now we want to see like, how much of the universe in terms of proper volume is this region which didn't smooth occupying? And in these coordinates, in these constant mean curvature slices, it turns out that the volume element um, here goes as e to the minus three times the scale invariant lapse times time. Now I'm just showing you this, this, this sort of this Hubble normalized uh, lapse function. And so what, what you'll see here is that in the, the region of the universe which isn't smoothing, this is quite a bit larger. But uh, the proper volume is going like e to the minus times the e times e. It's, an, it's a negative exponential. So the ratio, if you compute the proper volume of this region to this region, this is growing exponentially relative to that region. So, so yeah, so this, this, this egg parodic mechanism can't smooth everything. But the regions which are sort of snagged and, and maintain this anisotropic behavior, at least in terms of these constant mean curvature slices, are occupying a vanishingly small region we're in an exponentially vanishingly small region with time. So in that sense, it's actually a, it's a very robust, with, 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 this, with this model, this class of initial conditions, and we, we looked at a whole bunch of them, but it's quite robust. And now let me just briefly, also just show, just for fun, show this uh, equation of state parameter. So this is the initial conditions. And so you can see it, it doesn't make sense <laughs> here to think of the scalar field as a fluid. It's, it's all over the map. There are actually singularities you know, in that, you know, that's the denominator is going to zero at point, so it's not a, uh, you can't think of this as a fluid at all. But now as we evolve, in the two regions, it actually sort of separates into two sort of distinct regions. One is, this you can see, we say we had to have this greater than one to be in the smoothing region, it's much larger than that, and this, we, we control that. So in the, in the ekparotic potential, there's a constant that we tune, and we chose it such that this is a particular value. So this is a very strongly smoothing potential, much larger than one. But interestingly, you can see in this anisotropic region, it goes to an effective equation of state of one. And so there, you know, in, in remember it was three times one plus w, so the effective equation of state, the, the scale was six, which is the same as the anisotropy. So in this region, you know, neither of them is winning. They, in some sense, they're both conspiring to create a mess. <laughs> um, Okay, so, right, so in the last uh, five minutes, um, I just want to sort of now think about the steps ahead. So this was, you know, the, the stuff that we had done before, and now w w where do we want to go? And, you know, this is just going to be kind of sort of fluffy discussion, you know, but, but, but hopefully sort of it's just to show you some of the, the pitfalls that we might be expecting. Um, but as... You know, as, war, as you know, perhaps as dire as some of these warning signs might be, that also means opportunities. There's some real opportunities to study some of these very nonlinear theories and solve the problems. So I'm going to outline some of those. Um, and this is, this is, if you will, the continuation of where Anna left off. So she sort of showed the first few, few steps, and now I'm going to imagine where we're going to be going and what we might have to look out for. So to recap what, what Anna did, uh, what she spoke about yesterday is, and this is what I refer to as step zero, <laughs> is you've, you, okay, you've, you've, you've got some model and you find your homogeneous bouncing solution. So you find your exact solutions. But why I'm saying it's not really a first step for a viable theory that can make predictions is if it's, not a, if it's an ill-posed theory, finding exact solutions means nothing. Right, so but okay, but you have to find them. If if if, if those or if sorry, if, if solutions that represent the kind of backgrounds that you're interested in don't exist, okay. So she she represented she she gave some examples of those. Um, the next step is we want to find a formulation of the theory where at least 
looking at linear perturbations uh, of uh, the solutions around that background, it's well posed. So we want to show that the, the linearized problem is strongly hyperbolic. And we want to do that before we start the numerical code. And you, know that you might say, well, why did we just immediately start the numerical code? Well, the problem is we're sort of entering a re regime. We're entering sort of a problem where we, we don't quite know how well posed the theory is. And the problem with, with codes is that, especially when you start, when you first write them, what codes like to do is they like to crash. <laughs> codes don't like to be well behaved. And as anyone knows, it's, it's, it's a struggle to get them to the point where they're actually producing numbers that are, can be represented, that they stop producing NANDs. And that, that's, that's step zero. <laughs> step, step one in writing a code is actually to, to see that, that the solution makes sense. But if you can never get past the point where your code makes, doesn't make sense, how do you know what's going wrong? Are you, are you using a bad discretization method? Or is it just bugs in your code? So you, you want some kind of reassurance that the problem that you, you're, you're going to address should have a, have a solution numerically. And so that's, that's what this... That's why I think it's crucial that we first try to understand things from a mathematical perspective. And of course, we'd love to know if the full nonlinear theory, at least in the regime that we're interested in, is well posed. But that is, I don't think there are mathematical tools available yet to, to do that. So we were really restricted to looking at the linearized analysis. And so that's what Anna showed yesterday. And then, of course, another thing is that, as I'll mention, you know, even if you know, on this background things are well behaved, with these class of Wondesky theories, we know there are regimes of the theories where they are pathological. And we might be evolving towards those regimes. How can we diagnose that? And it's be useful to understand the linearized, pro uh, uh, the linearized uh, theories to, to, to <coughs> diagnose those issues. Okay, so, so what are the, the steps? So, okay, this first step is just saying, okay, well, we're going we're to take little steps. Like with the, the previous examples I showed, we're not immediately going to relax all the symmetries. You know, we're going we're to build as slowly as we can. But let me just sort of uh, describe some of the problems that we will likely encounter and that we'll have to solve. The first one, um, this is just, you know, this is, this is not even um, going to Hondesky. This is just Einstein gravity. And it's for, for, for theories like you know, these gauge theories which have constraints and we want to solve them as an initial value problem. You know, a strongly hyperbolic formulation is necessary, but it's not sufficient. And I'm not even thinking about discretization issues. So imagine we, whatever finite difference spectral, you know, you, whatever time steppers you use that are stable. I mean, those are other issues, but just from a theoretical perspective. The problem is, um, you know, even if, so that, that theory is going to be well posed. But if we can't con control the constraints, then we're going to get solutions that deviate from the real physical solutions that we're interested in exponentially. And, and exponential behavior is allowed in a well-posed theory. It's, well, it has to be because <laughs> many physical systems exhibit exponential growth. But the problem is if, the, if, if we're getting con uh, exponential divergence of the constraints, that's going to make it impractical to use these theories in, num in numerical methods because numerical truncation error or round off is always going to source those even if you you, you have them zero in the initial conditions. So you know, the Einstein equations, you know, that's one example of such a theory which has them, the Hamiltonian momentum. Electromagnetism has them, the divergence B constraint. Um, in electromagnetism, it's pretty easy to fix that, and the reason is because it's a linear theory. With GR, it actually, it's, it's not easy at all, and sort of the case in point is the binary black hole problem where it took a few decades to try to resolve the problem, and you know, there are many people here that, that worked on that and that know the history, but just to just to recap, you know, I say, you know, by the mid '90s, I think people were, you know, most of the relativity community understood that the ADM formalism that people had tried was weakly hyperbolic, and so people knew that we needed a strong hyperbolic formulation of the field equations, and that wasn't a problem. You know, almost every few weeks on the archive, there was a new proposition of a strongly hyperbolic system. Dozens were proposed. I don't know, perhaps, perhaps of order a hundred. <laughs> And the problem is it's not that they were well posed, but none of them you could control the constraints. And so it really took a long time before we got to a couple, you know, Harmonic and BSSM, Baumgart, Shapiro, Shibata, Nakamura, and variants of those that work. And incidentally, actually, even Harmonic evolution and out of the box didn't work. You needed to add these constraint damping terms. So you know, now applying these to cosmological scenarios based on harmonic evolution, we hope at least this problem we can control with similar methods. Um, but that, that is something to, to, to you know, that's, we're going to have to see if that's going to work out. Okay, but now suppose we control the constraints, we have stable evolution, it's well posed in the regime we're interested in. Um, we can anticipate 
path pathologies developing in these theories. And this is sort of schematically what these, what, what sort of this Hondesky type uh, theory does uh, or gives to the scalar field. So this is a, your usual nice scalar hyperbolic wave equation with a potential term, and these are sort of the schematically the form of the corrections. Um, so first of all, you can just see actually this, you know, if you want to, if you want to, if I wrote this suggestively as saying this is a wave equation, this is a hyperbolic equation, this actually doesn't make sense because here we have, you know, gradients times box. Here we have a box squared. This isn't governing the character of the equation. These terms, there are going to be regimes where these terms are going to be dominant and they're going to govern the, 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 the character of the equations. But then even then, we can see that there will be such, you can choose initial data for any background where this isn't a hyperbolic equation because you, know, the, you can pick the field and its gradient arbitrarily. So you can pick a value that zeroes out this term and these other terms are going to be dominant. So, and, and so you can, you can pick regimes where this looks more like an elliptic equation and you can pick initial data on some background where this, ha this as a differential equation makes no sense. So we know that these theories have regimes of, spa of, of the solution space that are pathological. And you know, the question is then, in one of these bouncing cosmologies, even if you know, around the bounce things are well behaved, what happens when we do perturbations? Might we evolve to a point where we have to start dealing with these problems? And it might be the case, perhaps not, no. But then I just want to say, thing, it might sound very dire, but it might not be as bad as we, as we might think. And there are three examples from existing theories where, where that turns out to be the case. And let me just finish by giving those. The first is general relativity. So general relativity you know, is not a globally well-posed theory. It, it develops problems, it develops singularities. And in fact, in the universe, the universe is riddled with singularities. But relativity has this remarkable property that, well, perhaps it's a pain, but it's uh, you know, from some perspective, but it's a remarkable property that in situations where we're interested in or where we think these singularities form, black holes, it's censored from us. So cosmic censorship is hiding you know, the problems from us. So we can still use classical relativity as a predictive theory despite there being singularities because the singularities are hidden behind horizons. So here relativity saves us from its own loss of predictability at singularities. Why I mention it's a pain is, well, we don't think that nature has a problem with singularities. So it would be fantastic if there were phenomena in the universe that were naked singularities, because they wouldn't be naked singularities, they'd be quantum gravity uh, phenomena. So it's a bit of a pain that nature doesn't want us to see what's going on <laughs> near singularities. But for classical predicti predictability, that's a nice feature. Another example is shocks in hydrodynamics. So yeah, Euler equations, they, they govern smooth flows, but we know these also develop pathologies, and many of them, and one example is a shock. And here, so what happens when a shock forms is, again, the, well, it's a singularity, but you can imagine, well, let's try to extend beyond the singularity. And the problem is that beyond the singularity, so where the Euler equations come from is conservation of stress energy. That by itself does not select a unique solution beyond the shock. But the way that we fix it, we get around it, is by adding other physics, and in this case, thermodynamics, and we demand that the solution post the shock generates maximum entropy. And these sort of these, these high resolution shock capturing methods, the, 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 the Riemann problem, et cetera, that's got that built in. And so we can get around that class of problem in the Euler equations. Another ex interesting example from fluids is um, sort of these, the, the relative plateau instability in a thin stream of fluids. So there's sort of some sense of topology change. So we have a fluid with surface tension. Um, a very thin stream of fluid is generically unstable, and it's unstable to beating. And so you know, when, when, when that topology change happens, um, that's also a singularity in the equations. Um, but the, in this case, the remarkable thing is that um, it's, it's so you're saying, OK, so it's, of course, uh, nothing singular is happening. It's just that the hydrodynamics breaks down as a valid theory. You think you need some molecular physics to understand what's going on. But here, remarkably, there exists sort of almost universal self-similar scaling solutions, both towards a pinch off and once after the pinch off, how this conical thing then settles back down to a spherical one. And it turns out that just from that, you can un understand this pinch off without knowing the microphysical theory. It's, all, it's almost like the microphysics that engineers the topology change is irrelevant. And actually, that might be sort of an interesting thing to, to get like motivating so perhaps non-singular bouncing cosmologies. Perhaps there is really, um, if there is a bounce, Perhaps it is really a quantum gravity regime, but it might do it in such a way where you know, it doesn't really matter. We have sort of universal uh, properties approaching the bounce, and if universal properties going away, how quantum gravity 
does the change might be relevant? And so that might be a hope for some of these things. Okay, so so let, let me let me just finish. So just in, in conclusion, you know, I think numerics is it's just a new set of tools that can be brought to bear in cosmology, and it's going to be relevant in situations where nonlinearities are interesting. As I've outlined, there are many you know, many challenges ahead. Some of them, I think, we can you know, borrow from what we've learned in uh, the binary black hole problem from from classical GR. You know, some might be really problematic, and you can say, okay, that's that's a warning sign. You know, that's going to be fatal for the theory. But perhaps, like as these three examples that I've showed you, it might be that the, the, this is giving us an opportunity to study a new class of nonlinearities that hasn't been studied before. And so how do we get past those? I think that could also be an interesting um, thing to discover in the future. So thank you. <laughs>